Okay, well, I guess we might as well uh, might as well get started, eh? Uh, today's uh, session, we decided that uh, we were going to talk a little bit about test equipment and what can be what test equipment can we homebrew? What may be better off to be left to uh, commercial purchases? And maybe a little bit of a review of what we have done over the years for uh, test equipment, anyways, as far as our buildathons were concerned, because we did do a few. Uh, build-a-thons with involving test equipment so we can talk about that and maybe there might be a couple might be worthwhile for a rerun if uh if uh, if it warrants it if there's enough desire for it or if not so we need to talk a little bit about that one uh but first let's just start off and just uh give a bit of an update as to what we've been doing the, since we last chatted a couple weeks ago uh with what's on our benches and uh quickly for me uh the uh modifications to the sig gen uh it's been progressing the the hardware side of things it's all mocked up from that perspective i'm having a bit of a bit of a tough time with the uh with the uh, unit actually reading uh the rf properly uh, i think we've narrowed it down it's something going on with the uh software and not the hardware Anyway, Kevin's going to help me a bit with that one. He's a bit tied up with the, with uh, with his work at the moment, uh, and uh, he's pretty busy. So maybe in a few more days we'll be able to sit down together and uh, go over it and just see what's uh, what's going on. Uh, the other thing that's been on my bench, uh, I've been playing a little bit with uh, GNU Radio and seeing if you can turn one of those uh, with a Hack RF and put a little bit of uh, uh, spectrum analyzer kind of thing together and see what happens there. So I played around a little bit with that uh nothing too serious uh, it kind of looks promising i know there's been chatter about uh, the noise that a hack rf can make uh and at, at some point i thought i could see that and other times nothing looks pretty good so i'm not too sure what uh what i did to cause it to work great and not so great anyway i haven't done too too much more with it other than just uh enough that I, i've seen enough that i'll go back to it and just see what comes out of it so that's what's been on my bench, and uh, and Frank's got his hand up there. Would you like to say something, Frank? Yeah, I just had a question with regard to uh, Hack RF. Um, I'm not familiar with it, but uh, from what I assume, it's quite similar to our uh, little pup. Can you confirm that? Uh, no, Hack RF is more of a software. Uh, how would you describe it, Dave? You you had a lot of talk with. Uh, it's, 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 like a dongle. it's like a dongle, but much more. You can, it, it can transmit and receive. Yeah, it's it's a it's a SDR, Frank. It's and it's a little bit more sensitive. It's got a lot more filtering, and it's got wider band bandwidth. Like for example, our little pup has got a up up converter, so that we can go from HF, and we flip the switch, and we could look at uh, the HF band. And right. if uh, that switch is not flipped, we're looking at VHF, right? With, right. Uh, with the uh, hack R RF, it goes all the way. I can't remember the lowest frequency. I think about I think, meg, I think, isn't it? I think it's about 20 megs. It's advertised. Oh, Go, no, but it's the roll off. It rolls oh, off. Yeah. Roll yeah. Okay, so it goes from about 20 megs right up to several gigahertz. Six and it also trans transmits. Oh, okay. Transmit is the big uh, difference between. Yeah, so it does. It does receive and transmit, but it's got a much wider bandwidth. But oh, okay. uh, the little pup will go a lot lower in 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 frequency. Like with the uh, hack RF, from from what I remember, once you get below about three or four megahertz, you know you're at that curve where it really starts tapering off, and you start losing it up. You know, 10, 20 megahertz. The roll off is very gradual, and then you know you're getting on the skirt, and you get much more steeper roll off. So the bandwidth for it, it's you know I I can't remember what it is. Someone should Google it. Look up uh, hack hack RF, but I think it's it's around 20ish megahertz to several gigahertz. But yeah. To answer your question, it's very, very similar. Yeah, that answers my question anyway. Thank, thank you very much, Dave. Okay, no, I think it goes up to about six meg, and I, I mean six gig, and I, but I haven't played with the roll offs. And you know what? In the worst case scenario, maybe it'll be good for just relative measurements or just seeing if something's there 
or not, not 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 necessarily for an absolute measurement, not without a whole pile of uh, of uh, calibrations and whatnot. But anyway, that's what I've been messing around with on my bench. So uh, with that, maybe we'll just do a little bit of a quick uh, roundtable with everybody and see if they can give us an update on any of the projects uh, uh, that they're doing. And uh, Frank, you're uh, you're first on my list here. Okay, I haven't been doing uh, very much on the uh, on the bench. Um, however, I did uh, work on the development of an adapter board that will take the um, uh, direct conversion uh, oscillator the, uh, that we are proposing for the DC receiver, and it's um, a uh, SO223, uh, very small um, uh, uh, footprint on it. And uh, I came up with a design where it will be uh, positioned inside of a uh, eight pin dip socket. So um, I uh, made a circuit board on that, but I, uh, I haven't put the component on there yet. Being uh, very busy with uh, um, uh, not only Jitsi, but uh, uh, the other uh, <laughs> uh, video conference formats uh, that are out there, and uh, that's been taking up a lot of my time. So ham, ham radio got kind of pushed pushed to the background, but it's not dead yet, and uh, I'm still working on the uh, DC uh, receiver. Okay, well, that was good. Thanks, Frank. We get to see that uh, adapter board. Ken would like to see that adapter board. I bet. Actually, he was here, but he looks like he's dropped off for some reason. Uh, Michael, you you put your hand up. Do you still do you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. You had a question? Can't hear you, Michael. I think you're still muted. He's muted. Yeah, he's Thanks, so. Oh, uh, you're muted again. How's that? Yeah, give it a shot. Okay, yeah. I've been, I've been looking at uh, the COVID design, and uh, I've been trying to get the, um, the CNA to work properly with uh, with the crystal uh, test board, uh, crystal test jig. And uh, <clears throat> as far as... Uh, it wasn't working, so I, I, I checked. I wondered if I had a cable problem, but I checked. Hey, Michael. Um, Michael. With the bandpass filter for OBS, and it seems, yeah. I was just going to say, it sounds that your your audio yeah. is quite garbled, and sometimes just exiting out and then Can't coming back in will, will cure the problem. You want to try that? Do what now? Restart. Restart yeah, just exit out of Jitsi and then come back into it again. Sometimes that cures the audio problems. Just just hit the refresh button. Okay. The little button with the circle. Yeah, he doesn't have to reset or um, come out and come back in. Just hit hit the reload button. By the way, Peter, I just went on the hack RF site, and you're right. It is from one megahertz to, to six gig. So I'm thinking of something else. I'm confusing it with something else. So it is, in fact, one meg to yeah. six gig. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Okay, I think that's Michael's back in. Oh, no, that's Marty. I don't know. where. Okay, well, Dave, why don't you give it, wait for Michael to come back in while he's coming back in. We'll see. Any update from your non-shack? For me? No, nothing, man. Nothing. Okay, I've done right. zero in terms of electronics. Um, I have to fix my son's water bottle. Does that count? Yeah, right. Okay, you can go on mute now. Okay, Al, you're up. <laughs> Al, you're up next. How's your what's on your bench th this week, last week? Sorry, there I am. Well, um, a couple of things, I guess. My uh, my vacuum tube uh, DC receiver. Uh, I finished the assembly on it. Uh, no smoke, but uh, mysterious uh, lack of uh, signal. Don't know where that's gone. A uh, little bit of a side trip there. Uh, we had a couple of hot days. I turned the air conditioner on, and uh, my spectrum analyzer uh, 
uh, stopped working. Uh, <laughs> it seems it doesn't like the humidity in the basement here, so uh, uh, it's dried out and started to work again. So uh, uh, it might be time to get a new uh, spectrum analyzer. <laughs> Um, um, Dave, I don't mind taking you around uh, Dayton next year to buy a spectrum analyzer. We've got lots of experience there. Oh, I probably would be very interested in that because uh, I've got an old uh, Advantas. It's a CRT-based thing. It's uh, When it works, it's fine, but uh, it's probably time to, to upgrade. Um, apart from that, not too much more progress. I uh, just spent the weekend installing a new... Uh, uh, UHF, VHF, mobile into uh, the vehicle. So uh, I've been learning how to remove seats out of the car, drill holes and panels and fish coax through everything. So uh, I, I'm now an expert on how to run coax in a, in a, in a Dodge pickup truck. So <laughs> that's about all I have to report right now. Um, nothing planned, uh, at least until uh, the weekend. Okay, that sounds great, Al. Thanks for the update, and I uh, look forward to hearing more when you finally get the, the, the uh, tube uh, DCR receiver up and running. I bet you Simon would like to hear that one as well. Uh, good evening, Brian. How are you tonight? Oh, okay. Uh, well, I got some parts from my QCX project uh, from the home hardware, so took a couple trips because <laughs> they gave me the wrong stuff, well, some of the wrong stuff or incorrect stuff or not appropriate stuff the first time. So I, I phoned down the next time and said, here's what I want, I'll come pick it up. I don't wanna stand there at the door waiting for you to ferret around. So putting some of those things in. And uh, I started working through, I think I said something on the uh, email list about this on an old uh, direct conversion receiver I had gotten some years ago from a guy that uh, purportedly worked and I, I think maybe it did work when I got it, but I don't have strong recollections. I may have just played around with it a little bit. But anyway, since we had been on that DC retriever, retriever, yes, I have retrievers, DC retriever receiver project, you guys, I thought I would take a look at this and see what's going on. It's quite an interesting circuit uh, from a venerable source. So I'm working through that uh, stage by stage uh, and learning as I go a little bit about the, the parts and the components and what they do or maybe what they do and and uh, how things are laid out. Still staring at a couple transistors and wondering where, where they get their power from. <laughs> Doesn't seem to sort of derive from anything that's obvious, but uh, we'll put some voltage probes on there and see what's happening where. And um, I think that's about it. Uh, so I'll hand her back to control. Okay, well, thanks, Brian. That's interesting. Good, uh, I look forward to hearing the, well, when you get it running and seeing how that works out. And uh, for the guy whose shack is in the chicken coop, uh, Eric, uh, what, what's been on your bench? Well, when you're muted, nothing, so. All right, sorry about that. Uh, just uh, doing a little prep here. So it's funny you should say that. Uh, so the shack uh, isn't looking too uh, healthy right now, but uh, I will share uh, this with you. Uh, can everybody see that? Whose shack is that? That's that's not the shack. That's the workbench. So uh, and this is actually an improvement. Uh, uh, you can actually see there. There's there's the Siglent scope. Uh, sorry, not the scope. That's the uh, power supply. Uh, the scope is I don't know somewhere over here. If you can see my pointer. But uh, anyway, the uh, that's been the state of my uh, workbench for the last year or so. And uh, all of the uh, space in front of the um, the, the table there has been cleared out uh, today. I spent most of the day starting to clean things up, uh, ready to assemble some of those shelving things to uh, get things whipped into shape. So I'm hoping by uh, this time, uh, the next time actually, we have a Jitsi meeting uh, that's off uh, off our regular, uh, it'll be all something uh, that I'm proud to uh, show. So this is this is all I've got to show right now is that I'm in preparation stages for uh, getting my bench uh, back into shape. Uh, um, got all kinds of things sort of on the go here. You know, there's a CNC machine uh, there. There's uh, uh, somewhere in there. Oh, I don't know. Well, there's lots of things. Spools of 3D, uh, sorry, um, yeah, 3D printer filament, uh, all kinds of stuff that uh, are on the, uh, you know, project list of things to do that are uh, all related to ham things and beyond. So so anyway, um, 
not a whole lot to uh, report other than uh, I'm uh, I'm in preparation stage, I guess, much like uh, Klaus has been uh, sharing with us over the last uh, week or two of his uh, preparation. So anyway, that was that. That was that. Um, so, okay. Dave, if you would like to speak. I mean, you had me going there for a bit. I thought, oh, that's great. And then all of a sudden I saw a box for a cuisine art. So I'm not too sure what kind of a ham shack has a cuisine art in it. But anyway, whatever. At least you may be going there. I think Dave would like to make a comment. Oh, I think so. He's put his hand up about 20 times. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everyone put dibs on equipment. That's our, That's the uh, ham fest. That's our next ham fest. That's everything that's going to be on sale. <laughs> I think if you can find any of it. Oh yeah, there's some gems. <laughs> yeah, I think you yeah. might be right. With the oh. next hand fest that we'll do our warm up for for Dayton next year will be your uh, Eric's uh, shack. Oh. Yeah, we should. Uh, you know, I should take a screenshot of that, and we mm -hmm. could post it to say, you know, <laughs> who's got dibs on what. You know, that's right. Well, I don't want the cuisine art. Okay, well, thanks, Eric, for that. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Dwayne, and uh, how's your bench looking these last uh, couple of weeks? Hi, everyone. Uh, got a couple little projects going on. It's still working on the uh, uh, digital dial that I had uh, mentioned last time. I designed a circuit board, had some made in China. They just showed up here the other day and in the process of uh, uh, assembling them and uh, Modifying some of the software so I can go and stick it on uh, a bit X40 board that I've got sitting around someplace that I haven't looked at in a couple of years Other than that not much Oh very good. Well at least you got so I think you mentioned that you got some parts come in from China I ordered a whole slew of parts from China and uh, I'm getting messages back where they've been canceling them I got so much it's gonna be a pain in the neck to see who who owes me money refunds and whatnot Anyway another story for another time. All right. Thanks Dwayne and uh, Klaus, I see you. Uh, you got your QCX. Uh, did you get it started yet? The Klaus file. Uh, <laughs> can you hear me, Klaus? Are you talking to me? Yeah, the, your audio got a little bit funny there. Try it again there. Uh, I see you got your QCX in the mail today. Did you start? Uh -huh. Is it me that's uh, not getting anything? No, your audio is pretty bad uh, uh, there. Maybe take uh, what uh, Dave suggested. Instead of exiting out and back, just do the recycle on your on your uh, browser and see if that improves your audio. Reload. Hit the reload button. Uh, Ken, you had a comment? Don't know what happened to Ken, but Michael, you have a comment? Everybody, everybody's audio is, everybody's audio, everybody's uh, audio is breaking up on my end. I don't understand a single word anybody's saying. Okay, looks like Ken can't hear anybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Just do a thumbs up or something if you can hear me okay. Yeah, okay, looks like it's all from your end, Ken. Uh, Michael, how are you doing? Well, okay, is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay, I just I just turned off the browser and started again. I've been uh, haven't been doing much. I've been playing around with the Colpitts oscillator stuff. That remember a year or so ago we found that oscillator uh, 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 video, and I've been playing around. And I just finally decided I would actually build it. So I've got some crystals that I got from uh, QRP me, I think it was. And I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll start <laughs> and uh, Simulate it first. So I went looking for the uh, emotional parameters for a seven megahertz crystal. Couldn't find any. Found I know I have the ones from the four point nine one five that you guys did, um, but I ended up uh, looking on the web and finding uh, um, a bunch of uh, crystals. Somebody did uh, tested a whole bunch of crystals. So I took the uh, emotional parameters he'd written down, averaged them for the seven megahertz crystal. 
and put it into LT Spice, and it came out with uh, 6.885 for crystal. It should have been around 7.15. So then I started taking the individual ones, and I got one that's sort of close. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just carry on then. And uh, so what I ended up doing was taking one of those and putting it into LT Spice, and sure enough, it, it oscillates like magic. And the next step I thought was to actually get the motional parameters for one of my crystals. I have a 7.04, and I thought what I would do is get the motional parameters for that. But I've been having trouble with the, I think it's it's the crystal uh, test jig uh, that goes with the SNA. I'm not sure. If, I'm beginning to wonder whether it's not wired properly. I know the cables are okay because I, I checked out the um, bandpass filter that we built for LBS, and I have the... Uh, characteristics of it from the mini VNA that I have and I checked it with the SNA and they're the same so that means the uh, cables are okay so I've got another problem somewhere and I'm taking I'm going to take the test jig apart and rebuild it probably and see if that helps so that's what I've been up to the only other thing uh, one of my friends told me about a program called multi-sim it's an online uh, equivalent of LT Spice and I took I took a look at it today but um, I think I prefer LT Spice since I know what I'm doing anyway that's all I've got so uh that's what I'm up to. Okay, thanks, Michael. Yeah, I, I, years ago, I took a look at that multi-sim and decided, you know what, life's too short to learn all these different packages. <laughs> I'll stick with LT Spice. Don't know if I mentioned it before, but I meant to think about LT Spice. Uh, the uh, Mike Inglehart, I think is his name, the the, uh, the author of it, he packed in uh, LT. And uh, anyway, he made mention on the LT Spice Group IO that uh, he's rewriting it. And uh, it sounds like he's probably going to make it open source as well. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Frank, did you have something? To, I know Frank and Dave had their hands up. Frank, did you want to make a comment? Uh, no, um, that was just in response to uh, your question whether we could hear you or not. So uh, carry on. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, usually thumbs up are a bit quicker. <laughs> uh, Dave, you had a comment? Yeah, I was going to ask whether he had the uh, SNA, but yeah, he, he has it. Uh, so, uh, Michael, what you could do, if you go to my YouTube channel, there uh, there's a bunch of uh, videos there, uh, tutorials on how to use LT, um, the SNA, and there's a tutorial there how to um, measure crystals. So you should, you should take a look at that. Also, too, you might be interested in this little Java program I wrote. It's a Java GUI program, and uh, I use that extensively to characterize my fill. Instead of using LT Spice, because it's a pain in the ass using L LT Spice to characterize filters, because then what termination do you use? How do you terminate it? So this little LT, this little JavaScript program, what it does, it uh, you can specify all the crystal motional parameters. You could uh, specify the uh, coupling. Capacitors, whether it's uh, you can specify the impedance at at the end, and then you generate a plot. You do a sweep, and it shows you what the performance is. And it's got even got an optimized button where it'll cycle through various uh, inductance um, terminations at the start and end to give you what the optimum termination is to get you the best curve possible. And I'll do that for checking like coupling capacitors because I did that because the the original um, crystal filter I was using, which was designed by um, what's our friend N six QW Pete. Oh, Pete. Pete yeah, uh, that was the crystal filter from Pete Giuliano, and uh, it, it doesn't work very well. So by going in. And optimizing this, I was able to change uh, the impedance at the tail end and change coupling capacitors. And I was able to get a pretty good curve because otherwise I would get, you'd get a curve where it comes up and all of a sudden there's there's like um, ripple in the pass, pass, pass band. And that would distort uh, the audio that's coming through. So I was able to take it and get very little ripple going across the uh, passband, 
which is what you you want. So that's something you may be interested in. Contact me off net, and we can we can talk about that. Okay, I'll do that. Um, yeah, I was actually that that was my starting point was uh, your uh, your YouTube video on using the uh, analyzer for filter for crystal emotional parameters, and uh, I was just getting a really flat looking curve, which I thought had I think might have to do with the uh, the test jig not being set up properly. So I'm, that's why I'm redoing it. I know the as I was saying, I know it's I know the cables are okay because I I put the bandpass filter on using the filter uh, part portion of the uh, SNA, and I get the same filter characteristic I I got with the mini VNA, so it's fine. So I just got to figure out what's wrong with the uh, with the test jig, I think that that's what it is, because I should be able to get a, a really sharp peak. I would have thought, right? If you're commenting there, Dave, uh, you're still muted. What's the frequency of the crystal? It was seven point oh four. Yeah. That's what I was yeah, you trying. Should, you should get a pretty good because uh, I found with the test jigs we have any crystals below about three and a half megahertz. It doesn't work very well. Yeah. Like okay. if you were if you're gonna go and characterize a one megahertz crystal, forget it. It doesn't work very well. But anything above three or four megahertz, it you should get pretty good good results. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see the? Uh, can you see oh. the uh, jig? It's about four inches long. It's on one of these perforated board things. And anyway, hold, I'm um, hold it up right? higher. Oh uh, yeah, of course, up there. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's about the width of my hand almost. Why is there one transformer? I took it off. Oh, okay. I think I think, I think there's a problem with it. That's I'm I, I'm not convinced it's wired properly, so I took it off. I'm going to redo it, and likewise on this side too. Okay. Anyway, yeah, we thought we saw the problem right away. On a board like that, hey, on a board like that, it should work. It's it's not too big or anything. I wouldn't have thought. So I don't know. Anyway, that's where I am. Did we, um, Frank? Peter, did we, as part of the the SNA project, did we supply a jig for the um, yep. crystals? Yep, we did. Okay. And is is it described in the manual how to build it and a schematic? Yeah. Yes, it's in the manual how to build it. It is a diagram of it. Okay, no, which is what actually, I used. No, so well, you use, use that. Actually, you know what? I think for the SNA, we did uh, a return loss bridge. We didn't do a. We didn't yes, that's do, right. We didn't do the uh, crystal jig. We did this one here, which is the return loss yep. bridge. Yeah. But uh, the crystal, oh, the, the jig for the crystal uh, stuff, you had to build on your own. But we did supply the schematic, I believe. Yeah, I have the, I have the schematic, so it's just a matter of, and I, I've already built it once. But there's something, I think there's something wrong with it because it's not peaking at all. So uh, I got to play with it. Okay, uh, give me a section. Uh, why don't we continue on? And give me a second, I'll go look, and I'll find what schematic I've got for it, and I'll give you the link for it, okay? Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. That's good. Thank you. When you when you build your next version, Michael, I suggest you see how I've got the uh, two BNC connectors like that? That is perfectly lined up for the SNA, so you don't need any cables. You can put directly into it, and that's, and that's what I did for the, uh, for the crystal jig. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you've got a, you've got a nice board there. I don't, I don't have the uh, I haven't got into building uh, PC boards. Too much work for me, anyway. Ah, uh, you so. never. Know. Once you get started. <laughs> All right, thanks, Michael. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Hassan. Anyway, that's where I am. Okay. Uh, Hassan, what's on your bench? All right, I got a few things. From my young nephew who's discovered elements in the periodic table. So I built him a Geiger counter. So here is, I don't know if you guys can see. It. So that's the Geiger tube. Here's a bit of something I got out of a smoke detector, and you can see it blinking. So I'm trying to build a display for him. I've got this thing here, but I think I should get a bigger display, and I'd really like that analog dial that, that you had. They're doing so. I mean, I'm trying to figure out what to do about that. The package is all up nicely. So, this is just the kit I bought off the internet. 
second thing is this is the power supply board for my oscilloscope. I'm trying to repair it, but this is like a one of those projects I'll never get to. <laughs> it's just too tedious. I mean, I have to get on the Tektronix Scopes message board and get some help there because there's a lot of funny components on here, which are, you know, it's like a 30 year old scope. But on that note, the current project is I'm trying to buy another scope. And so I've been looking at all the, every scope brand out there, trying to narrow down. And at this point, I'm almost thinking I'd rather like my own scope. I, I looked into how they do it. They take like 100 megahertz um, ADC, and it's got like eight inputs, and they just use them all in parallel by talking them slightly out of phase, like one after another. That gets 800 megahertz, and 800 megahertz per second. And they overclock it by 25% or 20%, and they get to one gigasample per second. And I'm thinking if we use that trick at HF, we could probably just get a cheap ADC and just kind of, you know, parallel it and then basically cover, get like a 30 megahertz SDR that covers the entire HF band. But I, I'm thinking that would be a fun thing to do now. It sounds great to me. Uh, we'd like to see uh, see you uh, experiment with that in Hassan and uh, report on that. Um, there, I, someone yes. by the name of Fellow Jitser had his hand up. I think that's Ken, since he's the only one with no label. But uh, did you have a question, Ken? Uh, no audio, Ken. Muted, Ken. Do you want me to provide the oh, audio? There we go. There we go. Let's switch upside down. Uh, Hassan, that was a Tektronic scope? Yeah. yeah, go to go to the Tektronix group. It's an analog 300 megahertz. Yeah, go to the Tektronix group. Uh, they helped me fix mm -hmm. my tech uh, years ago. You'll get everything okay. you need. I think I'm at the point where I need to put a... Yeah, your audio is starting to act up a little bit. I put a... Ken, uh, where is that I group need to, to test it with when it's on. Yeah, your audio is getting a little bit messy there, Hassan. Uh, Eric, you had a question? Yeah, well, actually, two okay. questions now. Ken, uh, where is that uh, group located? It's a Tektronix uh, forum. Yeah, like on what service, though? Like groups.io? Uh, or? Uh, I don't recall. It was years ago, but uh, over a period of a couple months, the guys yeah, were able to help me fix mine. Okay, that's uh, that's good to know. Um, and Hassan, uh, did you uh, put a banana yeah. near your guy or counter? I'm curious. No, I think Hassan's audio is a bit uh, messed up. <laughs> Hassan, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I was just kidding. I was wondering if you put a banana. Apparently, they can uh, set off the Geiger counter. But uh, I'm actually curious about your little project there. Uh, that kit. Uh, are you happy with it? And uh, if so, where did you uh, acquire it from? Um, I got it from Amazon. It was like sixty bucks or so, and it works perfectly. I let it sit in the basement, and it has like a nice background level, like twenty counts per minute. I think. I take it upstairs and it's a lot less. And, you know, it works reliably, it works perfectly well. It has a single five volt output. So you just put it into Arduino and count the pulses and then show it on the screen. And I'm just graphing it there. So, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful kit. It's quite, there's no assembly required either. So, yeah, I'd recommend it. It's, you can use it to detect radon around the house and things like that, detect granite countertops, stuff. It's pretty cool. Oh, radioactive granite countertop. Oh, great. Okay, well, thanks for that, uh, uh, Hassan. Thanks. Oh, Dave, you have a comment? Yeah, I'll for you. Yeah, I just, uh, just want to show Michael the uh, test jigs. So, Mike, this uh, is this being recorded? Michael, you want to just maybe get your phone, take some pictures? Okay, so here's various test jigs. I'll give you the... Uh, they're all basically the same. Okay, this is from an article. 
by Nick Nick Kennedy. Okay, and all these uh, test jigs, they're all basically the same. If you look at the test jig here, it's got an attenuator, three or four dB attenuator, which is fixing it to 50 ohms. So that, that's a 50 ohm attenuator. So it's forcing, you know, the transformer to see 50 ohms. You've got a transformer, and I can't remember, I think it's something like six ohms to 50 ohms ratio, right? And then you got another transformer and the same 3 dB pad here. And if you go this- It's exactly the same design as you yeah, have So here's, here's the article I used to write the uh, software for the crystal characterization. This is the article I used. And if you go down to the end, they've got um, a jig here, which you can use. Here's their jig. There's no transformer, but it's a mm -hmm. it's a 50 ohm pad with the crystal. So all you're doing is just you're fixing the impedance the crystal sees, right? So you're getting uniform comparison between the crystals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. And uh, here is, here's, I think this is the one I built, right? So here it's actually 12.5 yeah. ohms. So it's presenting 12.5 ohms to the crystal and 50 ohms to the transformer. So the crystal sees 12.5 right. ohms and this is locking it to 50 ohms. That's why I've got these pads. Yeah, that's how you described uh, the one in the SNA as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's big. And if you go, you could look at every other, there's tons of articles where it's basically the same thing. It's a variation of the same transformer. I've got a whole bunch of articles here. Could you send that this particular one to me? Because it talks about the VNA. That would be the mini VNA. That would be interesting. Which one? Uh, this one here? This one, yeah. Could you? It's the same one. It's the same as this picture here. Oh, yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Get up. Recording. Recording. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. If uh, yeah, if if you could send me one of those, the article, I'd maybe I'd appreciate it. Would be good. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see where are we are now. Okay. Thanks for that. Thanks, David. Um, Klaus, how's your audio now? By the way, uh, Klaus, keep in mind uh, if you uh, hit the. Uh, uh, you can hit the uh, uh, no, still something wrong with your audio, Klaus. Okay, hear me okay? Got you that time. A little bit garbled, but I heard you. Okay. You're okay. Yeah, it's not coming in very well. It looks like you maybe have a bandwidth problem because your uh, your video feeds a bit jumpy as well. Okay, let's go over to uh, Marty then. Uh, uh, Marty, good evening. Well, Marty was there, and uh, I guess Ken, you're still having trouble hearing us, correct? No, actually, uh, it's working better now. Okay, well, we got you now, Ken. So what's on your bench this week? Uh, just uh, I started hooking up the uh, SIGGENT to the uh, DCR. Uh, I've got to put it together a uh, attenuator. Other than that, not much going on. It's all work, no play. Well, that's no life. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Maybe I should be a retired guy, right? Yeah, I, I swear by it. <laughs> I'd love to, too, but I'd probably have to live on my car. Okay, thanks, Ken. Marty, you're back. Looks like you. No, I can't hear you, Marty. Well, I don't think we've had this much audio problems ever, but there's about three guys having the audio problems. I see Klaus is. Uh, 
switched rooms and computers probably. You want to try again, Klaus, and give us that QCX update? Yeah, how's that coming? Is that coming through better? Yeah, that's a lot better. Can you hear me now? Okay, I, I was in the basement, so maybe my router isn't getting that far. Well, you were in the red down there. It looks like you're in the green up here. Okay, good stuff. I'm happy for you guys. You can hear me. <laughs> so you got a nice uh, present in the mail today. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm working on too many things. I got the, uh, I'm up to five characters on my Morse code now, so I'm trying to improve a character a week. I got the uh, ARRL antenna handbook, trying to build some antennas. I got the, uh, I'm trying to build a power supply. I got myself a buck converter, and I don't know how I'm going to work that, but I'm playing around with that to try and get at least 12 volts out of the, uh, out of a uh, ATX power supply. So I needed a buck converter to bring it down to 12 volts from 18 volts. So I'm working on that. I got the, I got my phaser radio just came in today, so I'm uh, want to go working on that. I've got uh, a couple of kids coming in from QPR guys, so I think I'm doing way too much here. But anyway, it's fun. Oh, that's good. Uh, thanks for the update there, Klaus. Look forward to some of your updates on the QCX when you get that uh, going. It sounds like it should be a fun kit. Uh, is there anybody else? Have a, it looks like Marty's screen is frozen. So... Maybe Marty will get that cured and come in uh, shortly. Other than that, I think uh, I think we can maybe move on to the next uh, section. Then we're time. Okay, we're not too bad. We were having some discussions leading up the last couple of weeks on uh, test equipment, uh, homebrew and otherwise. I think there's probably some obvious things that are commercial type things like. Uh, an oscilloscope or spectrum analyzer and that kind of thing is probably better off being purchased. And uh, but for homebrew stuff, uh, we done some uh, over the years. We've done a few homebrew projects of our buildathons. Uh, we did a bench tester and um, uh, what else did we did? Crystal checkers, signal sources, an SNA, a SIGGEN. But going over through of them, uh, uh, a couple of them kind of came up that uh, are good ones, uh, good projects, and uh, and maybe you might be able to do a rerun. The uh, signal uh, calibrate signal source was a good project. That could be a good one for a rerun, or at least if somebody wants to interested in it, uh, circuit board maybe, or at least to copy the design. Um, the SNA was an excellent project. Probably that was a fantastic project, one of the best we've ever done, I think. The only trouble with the SNA project is that uh, since that time, uh, the Nano VNA came on this came on the scene at about a sixty dollar uh, price uh, point on the on the Nano VNA. Uh, I don't think we can get an SNA down into that uh, that price point at all. Uh, Klaus, you you wanted to say something? You have a comment? Yeah, just a question here. You guys are all experts. You all move. <clears throat> Excuse me, you've all moved on to stuff that you need for your rigs. and But the basic stuff, uh, some of us would like to have that. Is there no way of saying, well, instead of everybody doing a project together, can we not make a selection and say, okay, this is something I'd like to build? Uh, maybe you wouldn't because you, you're you moved on and you're, you know, you right. like to build test probes for your oscilloscope, which is not really my interest. But I'm looking at the basic stuff, like, uh, like the antenna dipper, which is no longer available. But... Uh, that type of thing, so I can start from the beginning again because you've always got new people coming in, and uh, you know the signal generator was fun to build, but it doesn't really do me under any good as far as I understand. So maybe when I get more into it, I'll, I'll be able to use it but from the beginning. No, I just the basics. Yeah, I think you'll find uh, Klaus, that as you start, especially when you start building the uh, uh, the Sig Gen you're going to find that the signal generator is not going to be too far down the road that you're going to want to use it. Um, I know when I got started, I started off basically with uh, just a DVM. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have a, uh, have a scope. And uh, one of our early on projects was a, uh, an LC meter. And, uh, and that, that worked fine. But it wasn't too long after that that I was uh, really needing a signal generator to uh, go along with it. Uh, Dave, you had a comment. Yeah, I had to find an unmute button. Yeah, Klaus, the signal generator is probably going to be one of your most 
um, as Peter said, it's it's going to be one thing that you're going to be using all the time. You're going to be building the phaser, right? Well, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So so how do how do you go about testing that? Because when when you build that, you need a signal source. So one of the things you could do with the signal generator is just attach a empty BNC cable to it, just connect the cable to it and put it right beside your phaser. Set it to the frequency of the phaser and the phaser will pick it up. If it's working, you'll be able to hear it and you'll be able to uh, tune it. So little things like that, it's very helpful because it allows you instead, because you know, you're gonna build the phaser and then you're gonna have to connect it to an antenna to see whether it's working, right? Oh yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. When Frank uh, proposed a signal generator last year, he really sold me on it. And uh, I realized that what he said that in the future I'd be able to use it. But uh, if I hadn't bought the phaser and I'm just working on antennas, I don't know if the signal generator would have been a better project for me than uh, some sort of antenna analyzer or, or uh, whatever you want to call it is. So if, if you guys say, okay, we have 10 projects that you can build, pick your own, build that one, and uh, it might cost you a little bit more, but at least you can pick and choose what you really need. And I, th I think one of the most important pieces of equipment you can build, and it, this is coming back to a comment Hassan made, is to build a receiver. Because with a, with a, with a receiver, there's all kinds of things you could do with it. So this... Uh, this upcoming DC direct conversion receiver we're, we're building, that's going to be really, really important to you because all of a sudden you've got something which you could listen to a signal. You could just take your uh, receiver, you could just hang a wire, just connect just this one wire to the, an the antenna, put it close to your rig that you're building and working on, and you could tell whether the oscillator is running. And you could do lots of things like that with a receiver. So a, uh, a, a receiver is um, something that's, I, I think it's a good first step uh, uh, to build. Also, too, from learning, you understand the basics of a radio. I'm looking forward to building it, and I can't wait for the thing to come out and we can all I'll build it together, yeah, it's, it's the only way you're going to learn by doing things. That's for sure. Build and you will learn. Uh, Hassan had a comment. Yeah, one of the things about that conversion receiver is to go up to a gigahertz, let's say, then down mix any band and into your oscilloscope's pass band. So then basically you don't need to buy like a megahertz scope. You just use like a 10 megahertz scope and you can just down mix any band into the into that. So then that would be a really good thing to use with your test equipment. So you're no longer limited like you, in terms of, you don't need a high bandwidth scope anymore. You can use a cheap scope, but then you can actually, you know, just look at any RF band in between and any you want, VHF and UHF. Yeah, that, that's interesting, doing that sort of thing. And many, many years ago, I was thinking of going to do that, but I never did get around to it. So when you were talking about doing something with the FPGAs, that's, uh, that brings things even into light there. It'll be an interesting project to see how that goes. And I think to Klaus's point about a basic toolkit and stuff, I found that I always kind of say, which came first, test equipment or the project? You know, was, you know, And what I mean by that is, as you're building projects or more complex projects, you were you were driving the need for different or better uh, test equipment. And as you acquired uh, more test equipment, you found your capabilities of taking on tackling more complex projects were increasing. So they kind of fed off of each other. So starting with doing the the direct con so actually I guess because your first project I guess basically was the uh, signal generator. So. You know, once you start building your QCX and you do the direct conversion receiver, you will find that you'll start, uh, those projects will start to drive other pieces of test equipment, not just a signal generator. And that's kind of how things things grow. 
until you get to the point where you buy a scope or you you know maybe a semiconductor checker and some of the in some of these pieces of test equipment you use once in a blue moon or not 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 often but when you do use it you need it but that's all part of the fun of the game and uh and like i say over the years uh We've built several ones. Like one was actually one we were talking about. It kind of reminded me of our super probe, and that and the super probe, it uh, it handled a lot of little different functions in it, from frequency counter to voltmeter to uh, a signal generator. I think of uh, in there. I can't remember exactly everything, and, then, and several other functions in it. Actually, too many. You had to carry a manual with you if you wanted to use them all. But I used to take that on the camping trips with me, and uh, and that was a handy little tool. Um, Al, you had a comment? Yeah, I, um, I guess I, uh, I, I think I started this whole thread. And what I was concerned with was uh, newcomers. Uh, a, a lot of us have most of this equipment because we've been around long enough. I don't have all of it, but I've got a, a good toolbox myself, which I'm quite grateful with. Uh, I think I mentioned in my... Uh, vacuum tube project uh, i've used five or six of the park projects uh, and they work fantastic um i'm worried about newcomers people coming up to the ranks uh close here in you know prime example uh we've got a bunch of fellas here that uh i don't want to say been there done that but how do we ensure that uh new people coming up get access to a lot of these projects? Uh, do we do a rerun or do we have a, um, you know, we've got all these wonderful manuals and PC boards. So we've got the basic kits in the archive somewhere. Uh, maybe we should uh, do some product reviews and we can recommend some other kits, uh, perhaps because previous ones are not uh, in uh, manufacturing anymore. Uh, but it was just, uh, I was wondering how we could get these projects to newcomers, uh, but, especially how do we integrate it with uh, build-a-thons? Could we do a build-a-thon where we're doing a new project and then half the people could be doing a rerun at the same time? Um, just throwing it out for thoughts. Yeah, it's a good point. And we had little discussions prior to this uh, and this sort of thing. Like, and a good example of what started off, I found was really handy was an LC meter. And in the case of the one that we had built back then is no longer available. So it would take a little bit of research to, to come up with that one. But if you're looking at the basic toolkit, starting out going on there, I would say an inductance, an LC meter is, is a really good tool. If you're gonna be messing around with RF stuff, well, you're gonna be doing that. As a matter of fact, I use the LC meter far more than I use the DVM. Uh, the other one's a scope was a good, uh, good, uh, thing to have as well. When I was first starting out, uh, got a couple of guys who want to, uh, say, Frank, you're up first for a comment. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to review some of, uh, what we have done in build a -thons and also what is, uh, reasonable and what, what is it, but, um, just in summarizing, uh, referencing test equipment only, um, of the 26 build -a -thons we've done, we did 15 pieces of test equipment and um, anything that we bought from um, a manufactured or uh, a, a, another club, etc., pretty well are not available anymore. It boils down to uh, only six projects that are feasible now. Um, and uh, uh, most of them we have uh, uh, designed ourselves. But the, um, the first one, oddly enough, was our very first uh, build-a-thon, which was a NorCal keyer. And how can that be used as a uh, test equipment? Well, um, definitely you have an audio generator there right off, off the bat. Mind you, it's repeated in several of the other uh, projects we've had. Uh, particularly the, uh, the the signal generator, but the basic test equipment that you that you will need is something to uh, to measure uh, your voltages and whatnot, which is basic. Uh, here's something of interest. That's my first uh, piece of test equipment. Uh, it is a uh, vacuum tube voltmeter. 
uh, from Heathkit. I, uh, it's still in perfect condition and I still use it from, from day to day. But of course that's being replaced by a commercial piece of equipment. So it's not worthwhile for us to go into a basic uh, uh, DVM of any type. And like Peter says, the uh, one thing that uh, I use more than any than that is of course, is the LC meter. When you're building equipment to check components, then this, this is the one. That's no longer available. However, the uh, one that we built was the General uh, Park uh, bench tester, and uh, it's still available uh, from uh, uh, China. So it may be a consideration that, uh, that we also I want to look at. Um, another one that uh, would be good on the bench uh, is an oscilloscope and then following that would be your uh, signal generator in, in, in that order. So once you get those basic uh, units uh, then you'll be uh, set up to do just about anything on the test bench. Okay, thank you Frank. That's uh... Well said. Uh, I agreed with uh, how you how you lined that up as well. Uh, Dave, you had a comment. Yeah, what I was going to do, I was just going to pull up the. Uh, I think Frank made a comment on the forum. Let me find the web page. Where's the web page here? Ah, here. Okay, so let me share this. Oh, go ahead. And uh, it's got all of our projects. Frank referred, can, can everyone see this? Yep. So Frank, why not uh, keep this up and maybe you could just kind of, cause you talked about a few of these projects here. And I think Peter, you talked about a few of them as well. Do you, do you wanna maybe, I could point out which ones you were talking about here? Sure. Is that a value? Yeah, yeah we, can, we can do that if you like. Okay, so maybe just kind of talk about which of the ones here you were talking about, and we could kind of highlight it. Um, <laughs> go down. Okay, the one at the bottom here the, in the Altoids tin, that's the uh, NorCal Pier, and uh, that's quite repeatable and uh, useful as a piece of uh, test equipment. Um, another one is the uh, Super Probe. If you go back up, I think I saw it someplace. Yeah, it was up there. Uh, right there. Uh, it's on the top center now. Well, get that in there. Yeah, that's the Super Probe. And then going down, we had the um, Crystal Checker. Uh, where is that? <laughs> oh, here you go. Here's the Crystal Checker in there. Um, that was a, just a general handy piece of equipment, not necessarily uh, particularly Im important. Um, the last three we've done, all of them are good pieces of test equipment. The uh, SS 4x4. Now, I'm not too sure this particular uh, group has been updated with the very last ones we, we've done, but uh, the uh, uh, signal source a uh, 4 by 4 signal source. Now it's preempted, of course, by the park signal generator. But uh, the one thing about the signal source, it gives you uh, fixed levels of signal so that you, when you get a piece of equipment working, you can verify how, uh, uh, how well it's working and uh, reduce the signal coming into it to see exactly how sensitive it, it is. The um, Park SNA, the Scalar Network Analyzer, it uh, it was a uh, an excellent project, but maybe a little bit advanced for uh, uh, the basic uh, test bench. And finally, the uh, Park Signal Generator is a, a very good uh, uh, one to have on on your bench at any time. And as well, too, don't forget the little pup. The little pup, I use that. I used to use that all the time to measure signals. Uh, the little pup, I 
I think I broke mine. I used it so much I broke it. <laughs> but it's that's another really, really good piece of equipment, test equipment for, you know, it's a poor man's spectrum analyzer, really. And uh, it's just a receiver and allows you to see your signal graphically on your computer. So I thought that was a, a really, really good project. And of course, there's the uh, antenna dipper. It's a, there's no way, Frank, there's no way we could we could look at doing like a antenna dipper type project, maybe making our own board. Well, the uh, the antenna dipper is another one that uh, was produced by a third party uh, group, and uh, I don't believe it's uh, available anymore. But it's it's not something that maybe we could make our own boards for it. Uh, we might be able to to come up with something to do the same similar thing. Uh, really, the uh, the SNA replaced it uh, because it, uh, it it was more effective to use as a uh, um, as an antenna uh, analyzer. But for like someone like Klaus, who's just starting out, Klaus, do you find, have you been using the um, the antenna dipper, Klaus? You're on mute. Sorry. Klaus, Klaus you're on mute. When I, uh, no, okay, I you're on now. now. You're good now. Okay. When I put up my, my dipole up into my tree, Frank lent me his, and it, uh, it got me very, very close. Uh, as close as it could get with my poor installation. Uh, just to say on the antenna dipper, everything's available for that unit except for the PC board. So uh, this parts list, there's wiring diagrams and everything else there. So if somebody knows how to make a PC board, it can be uh, it can be copied. And one other point that Peter brought up, he's talking about an LC meter. I'm assuming he's not talking about a liquid crystal meter, which is uh, something else I need because now I'm, for test equipment, I have a multimeter, but it's my basic, uh, 127, 347, 600 volt uh, a multimeter. So that's not going to work for electronics. I've got to buy a little a unit that measures milliamps and uh, microamps and stuff like that. So I'm assuming this LC meter doesn't do that. Correct? Well, where I was going with it, see, the, here's the thing. When we first started all these projects, they were all standalones in their own right. Since that time, there's a couple of things that have happened. Uh, and in the case of the LC meter, which is an inductance capacitance meter, uh, Klaus, uh for example the bench tester project well that measures inductors and it measures uh capacitors it also tests semiconductors so you know we had a couple of projects that are now available that are now combined under in the uh, one piece of equipment like the bench tester eliminate two of our projects uh so a bench tester is a commercially pro uh, oh no that's a kit so that wouldn't be a good one uh, to to look at the, in regards to um, a tenant dipper, I don't know if we can produce a kit, uh, a tenant dipper kit. Uh, I mean, you'd be approaching, like, let's look at it this way. Uh, the Nano VNA is, is price point now is down into what, around the mid $60 range, somewhere around that neighborhood. So, you know, like we couldn't produce, we couldn't reproduce the uh, SNA anywhere near that price point. And, that, and this is a VNA. So we've got to be careful about these price points. Uh, same thing with the uh, with our tenant temporary. I think that was a Hendrix kit that we got. I don't know, Frank, if you can remember, but I'm sure we paid did we pay fifty dollars, more than fifty dollars for that particular kit. Uh, it was a Hendrix kit, but I can't remember what the price of it was. Yeah. Oh, there's the thing. I guess that's Dave that's got that up there. So. You, know, you kind of have to take a look at these things there because uh, you know even though the nano vna is very very small you can use it with software so it can make it a little bit easier to use but i would keep that part in mind now because that nano vna at that price point has only been in around the last year or so uh and that's a pretty hard price to uh to beat uh hassan had a comment there a while back uh, you still have a comment there hassan yes so one thing I'm noticing that's missing is a, an RF strength meter. So, I mean, just a general, R, I mean, feel, I mean, those things can be made very simply. You just take a coil and a, a diode peak detector and measure the voltage on it. But, well, you know, if, if it covers the handbands, that could be kind of useful. 
Well, actually, we have an in our SNA we use the eighty three oh seven chip, and uh, and actually that's what I I'm using in the uh, upgrades for the signal generator pro, uh, the SIGGEN. Uh, part of it is, is for RF sensing is using an eighty three oh seven chip to uh, to to do that. And you're right, it's a very simple, easy project. Uh, to build the 8307 chip is still available in a dip eight if you don't want to do surface mount maybe at uh, some point i'll take a i'll post the circuit although mind you it's almost the same circuit as you will find uh in the documentation for the sna but yes that is a very easy and a very good uh uh project to build and the software for it for your arduino uh dead easy to understand as well or hack into whichever way you want to go with it I think the hard part is the winding the coil for the sending coil because it has to be calibrated at some point. But I think that's something we could easily do. We just do a few experiments and figure out how that works. Um, so it'd be a fun project, actually. I mean, you could just hold it up to your antenna and walk around it and see where the field strength is highest. Yeah, no, it was a fun project. I, actually, I fried the finals in my SW40. When we talk about pieces of test equipment, I did not have a signal generator. And when I built my first RF uh, measurement meter with the 8307, the only signal source I had was the SW40. So I put the key down on it. So it was constantly putting out a carrier and I started messing around with the finals on it. And I was busy watching the 8307 chip's performance with the, with the voltmeter and, and the scope and everything like that. And I'm not paying attention to what I was doing with the SW40. So as I was writing down the data, I could smell smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did you, did you put it? finals on the SW40? So, <laughs> well, yeah, you had cables going. You had, it was a wired connection to your to your measuring to your 87 right? Yep. So I'm talking about a wireless probe, which just measures the field strength in space. Well, so yeah, you just, uh, stick a big antenna on the or stick an antenna on it. But no, you're right. It's a project that can be easily done, easily designed, cheaply. Yeah, I agree. I think you just need a resident LC circuit. I don't think they use full-sized antennas because I mean I have an RF field strength meter, but it's very compact. So they they do some tricks there. They just take coil and capacitor, or they make it keep it broadband. But that's the fun part to figure out because I don't think it's hard to construct. It just takes a bit of trial and error to figure out what works. Mm -hmm. Okay, well we have to keep that one in mind then. You, you're right because that would be a, a quick project actually. We need to have a session one night where we need to sit and talk about future projects, I think. I don't think I've ever seen anyone use a field strength meter near antennas. I mean, that'd be kind of fun to just probe. The, well, uh, you know, I guess the other thing too that's going on these days with Whisper, uh, you know, out there, you can you can do your antenna and just quickly uh, just go on the Whisper site and you can see how your antenna is performing. Yeah, but I mean, having it close up is kind of neat. You can walk around a unit and, you know, you can, it's like a grid dip meter, but it's more. Oh, yeah, it's I know more, what it is, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where we left off now, guys. <laughs> I see, keep getting signed. Somebody like this. Is there somebody out there who wants to hold up your hand? Somebody's trying to speak, but your mic is muted. Uh, I was holding up my hand. I want to share my screen with you guys. Fire away. Um, here's uh, the antenna dipper. How much is that one? And if we go, uh, it is 40, 45 US. I think it's exactly the same one we built, but it's been updated. Okay, so you're into about $60, $65 Canadian, somewhere around that neighborhood. So if you can yeah. purchase uh, the Nano VNA for roughly the same amount of money, what are you going to purchase? Yeah, VNA, of course. Well, that, that's, that was what my point is. The VNA, that Nano VNA has only come out in, the last, in that price area, what, in the last year and a half maybe? Yeah. No, I just want I just wanted to point it out that it was available. Yeah. So, um I also saw uh, the uh, no disrespect, but it's not available. Sorry, Pacific, uh, Pacific 
Yeah, the unit's not available. Okay. Yeah, I didn't think it was available because I remember sending them an email a while back a while back about about the uh, the tenant dipper, and they made some comment about that. Uh, Dave, you had a comment. Yeah, it looks like Norca um, NorCal QRP Club is selling them. So they're twenty five bucks, twenty nine bucks to uh, to uh, Canada, and that's probably U.S. So it doesn't, come, it doesn't come mounted in a case. It's just a board with chips. What's that, a tenant dipper? Yeah, yeah, I'll show you. I had it up before. Oh, right. See, it's NorCal QRP Club, and it says a uh, tenant dipper, 25 bucks, 29 to Canada. I don't know if it's uh, January. Oh, it's not. It's gone. Sold it's out. 2009. Sorry. Yep. Never mind. But uh, anyway, at the bottom. The other comment I was going to make is that yeah, Peter, you're absolutely right about the um, Nano VNA. You're hundred percent correct. You know, it's a better buy. But however, for someone like Klaus, it's completely over his head. He's not going to use that. For a while, and so the, the whole point of this conversation was: what is the basic test equipment that someone like Klaus or someone else is going to be is can can use? What's the best piece of test equipment for him to get? That's he, right now, he's going to get the best bang for his buck. I think Frank. Yeah, the question right. is: Is it educational? Do you learn something by uh, assembling a tenant dipper and learning its functionality? No, but you'll get there. I think Frank was right when he says the DVM bench tester and the scope, and then after that, the signal generator. Uh, well, Klaus has already got the signal generator at the moment. Uh, bench tester is a kit, and that'll cover off a lot right there. It'll cover off se checking your semiconductors. It'll check uh, inductance and capacitance. So that would be a, a, a good purchase. But that's, that's great for if you're building. Klaus right now, he's looking to get on, on the air, get his radio on the air. So what is he going to need that's going to help him get his equipment on on the air? I think the, the antenna dipper is a good project because that could help him get his antenna up and running. Well, those kits that are are retired, uh, yes, of course, probably reverse engineer it. But, but something like that where, you know, as a novice operator, What's a what's a really good piece of equipment that you're going to use to help yourself get on get on the air? I think that's 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 a key thing. Well, that would be an antenna dipper, I guess. Or uh, Al, is, there, is there something else? Yeah. Al, you got a comment? Yeah, just a thought. Um, the uh, the dipper has been kind of replaced with uh, antenna analyzers. I haven't been looking through uh, kit based antenna analyzers. I guess it's like a very uh, job specific SNA, but is there any uh, economical uh, uh, antenna analyzer kit out there that we could recommend? Not offhand anyway. <laughs> Hassan, did you have a comment with it? Yes, yeah, well, I don't have an answer to your question, but I was thinking of field here is the most direct way to get your antenna tuned as well. Just just tune the impedance until the field strength some distance away is at a max. And it's also the most direct form of RF measurement. So, I mean, it's, you know, and it's not something anybody else really uses in the world. So we'd be kind of pioneers in that sense. Okay. Uh, Marty, you got something to add to it? Where is it? Where go? There's no uh, like there's, Michael, there's no problem, Marty. Uh, I built uh, I is Michael. I built a um, BK five JST antenna analyzer. I got it half done. It's not finished. I've had it on my desk for probably years now. But uh, that's from Australia, and it was like one hundred and thirty five dollars or something. 
a kit you build it yourself comes a little box you can put it in and and whatnot so that's a possibility was that a kit michael you built was that yeah, it was uh hang, hang on a second I, I wonder if i can get it yeah. because i think that's the same kit i built but mine i it kind of works I, I think ken has mine but it 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 didn't seem to work a hundred percent i don't know um I don't know if you can see it, that's part of it. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, Ken, that's yeah. the same one I've got, right? Yeah, it, it, it's got an LCD display and all that stuff. And yeah, I think that's I the same, that's the same kit I've got. It's it's from it's from Australia, right? And that's yeah, right, yeah. There it is. What? Yeah. Is that it, Barty? Ken had it upside down. Maybe he's from down under. But I don't think that kit's available anymore. I don't think it's it's around. As I said, Klaus, you know, your best bet is to... Well, there's a... Um, what's that? Amfest online? Uh, Kawartha's... What's that? Uh, where you sell? I sold my antennas on that. Oh, site. the kitchen, uh, Kitchener Waterloo. Yeah, the ham swap, yeah. something like that. Yeah, Quark. Yeah. Can anyone remember? Because that, Klaus, that's where, you know, I sold my antennas there. And you could find a ton of stuff there. And you could set search parameters. And you can go and search for, for stuff there. And you might be able to pick up. Um, an antenna analyzer used for uh, on the cheap. Just look for Quark, K W A R C dot org, I think it is. Yeah, I bought it every day and I check it. And, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I got it up on the screen. That's right. K W A R C online. You know, another, org, you, know, org. you know, another option might be is just put on uh, Groups IO and, and the Park Main Club and just see if anybody wants to sell their SNA. How many SNAs were built, Frank? 30, 35, 40? I don't know. Um, over certainly over 30, that's that's for sure. But um, if someone particularly wants an SNA, send me an email and uh, I've got a list of the people that bought that uh, ha uh, built them and maybe one of those might uh, you know be willing to uh, to get rid of it if they haven't used it. And also, as well, keep in mind we have a gentleman here who's been very quiet. Yeah, and, uh, he's got a ton of SNA uh, models, different models he's built, and I don't know if he's got any boards. SNA Junior, if I, Junior, I think it's called. Is it not, uh, Dwayne? Yeah, I I have that and uh, got a version of the. Uh, Oh, what is it? Uh, Sweet Reno Jr. That, that I built that was basic based on, on Bosher and Arhan's uh, uh, thing. And uh, I actually have a little antenna analyzer that I had designed and built some boards, but I never even got around building it because the VNA came out and uh, pretty much replaced all of that. Everything's coming back to the VNA. Well, it, it came to light when they dropped the when the price went went way down, right? Is that a Chinese product? I guess so. Uh, somebody just held up their hand for I forget. Hold up your hand again. I did. I missed it. I think it was Klaus. I'm not sure. Or was it Hassan? Yeah, somebody elaborate. Somebody tell me what VNA stands for. Vector Network Analyzer. Okay, that's the one with all the tiles and grass are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, somebody else put their hand up, but I missed it. Sorry. Was that? Uh, oh, Dwayne, you had you had something else to say? Yeah, I don't know if you've been following the uh, the tiny uh, spectrum analyzer project that's going on. 
uh, the person who basically made the first uh, version of the uh, uh, Nano VNA is actually working on it. And they're getting pretty close to releasing a version of the Tiny Spectrum Analyzer. And I'm hoping that that's going to be available for under $100. Oh, that would be, uh, be a good deal. Yeah, off and on I've read up their updates. I forget which group IO site they're on. Is it, is it the test equipment group or is it one of the other ones? Uh, this in the test equipment group, and now there's another tiny SA group where the, uh, uh, the people that are actually testing some of the uh, uh, prototype hardware that they're, they're, they're planning on commercializing. Mm, okay. Did we confuse uh, confuse you, Klaus, or did we? Did you get any clarification? <laughs> No, the, uh, the one thing I found out about this hobby is you don't know anything about it until you start learning, and there's always something to learn. Nobody knows everything. So it's uh, I'm enjoying it, so I'm doing good. What I was trying to say before, Peter, am I coming through okay? You are now, Marty. Okay, I've got the video turned off. I'm, I've been kicked out of this forum about uh, ten times uh, <laughs> so far tonight. Some Some connection problem here. Anyway, what I was saying before, the nano VNA, everybody around here is getting them. So you don't have to know how to use everything on that. Uh, what most of the guys are using it for is just uh, pruning their antennas, getting their antennas in a resonant spot. And uh, they're having a great time with it. And you'll learn how to do other things with it as time goes on. But, you know, a, a few years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, those things were worth $20,000. Yes. So, I mean, that's a real piece of equipment there. I'm out. Okay, thanks for that, Marty. But you're you're right. And in Kingston here, there's probably about three or four floating around as well, along with other flavors of uh, of the uh, VNAs. It's just amazing how the how the uh, the price point on that has come down so much. Okay, um, well, we're up to about nine thirty. Is there any other comments from anybody, or anything further to add, or any questions? Uh, Klaus, you have something to say? Yeah, just a general question here. I uh, working on building some breadboards, and I wanted to make them look professionally as a schematic diagram. So I went on this thing that you guys were talking about the uh, the spice thing, the spice program, which uh, apparently draws schematic diagrams. Uh, now uh, it tells me I need to import electronic symbols in order to draw these circuits. And the chip I was using, uh, apparently this program is suggested I use, it's never heard of this chip. So how, is there something else I would get these electronic components into, uh, into LT Spice or? Well, if you're, if you're looking at just that, uh, are you just wanting to draw a schematic? Yeah, just a professional yeah. look at sch schematic rather than a pen and paper thing. Well, uh, this is where you probably get different people are going to make recommendations. I, myself, I use KeyCAD and i know dave uses something else i forgot the name of what dave uses so probably if you talk to two or three different guys you're going to get two or three different uh, uh programs to use there might be a, there'll be a bit of a learning curve for it but lt spice you generally you're using that for a uh a circuit simulation i know uh, some people might use it as a just for a strictly uh, having a record for a schematic, but I don't do that. I go, I, like I say, I use KeyCAD. Dave, what do you use? I use uh, dip, dip, dip Trace. I know Kelly uses Eagle. There's a whole bunch of other programs. Um, what else is there? KiCAD, which is what you use. I like KeyCAD. It's 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 open source. Uh, it's fully open. It's uh, well supported. There's a good user group on Groups IO for it. Uh, the CERN project has a team of uh, their people that uh, support KeyCAD as well. So that's a good sign for the future for KeyCAD. So you, you may want to go and Google them, Klaus. And there's a ton of videos on YouTube on how to use it as well. So you may want to start there, and then that would be a good way to start with your schematics. And then if you want to make a circuit board, get around to doing that someday, well, you've got your schematic there, and then that's, you can develop your circuit board from that as for that same program. So start there and just leave LT Spice for simulating your circuits. 
That's what I would recommend. Uh, Hassan, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, yeah so I set up my antenna back here. It's a short dipole, but a friend challenged me to figure out how it actually works. Um, how, how, I wonder if anyone can explain how the short dipole works. It's got like, some kind of a linear loading thing. Some of the antenna loops back somehow. It's not like 40 meters long, it's much shorter. But does anybody know how these like antenna loading coils work and stuff where you can actually have a shorter antenna than you need at resident like It doesn't have to be a full half wavelength, it's much shorter. Did somebody get enough of that to they could answer it? Were you? I, I didn't quite catch all of that, Hassan, sorry. Were you asking how does a shorty antenna work? Oh, oh, oh. Yes, yes. Well, the load. There was someone explain offline, maybe to me. I guess the simple answer is just that the loading coil or the, the coils that are in there are, are making it electrically longer, or making the antenna think it's longer than it really actually is by adding the inductance to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this one works by linear loading. I think the this this. Like it's got a funny pattern. It goes out and comes back in and then goes out again. So there's, there's, does anybody know, there's something funny going on? Uh, look at Bob Morton's uh, Maple Leaf Communications 8040 Shorty. He uses linear loading and he does have a coil in there as well. And that'll give you an idea. It's a dipole, it's linearly loaded, it's shorter, it's for 80 meters and 40 meters, and I, it's about 60 feet long. Look, look at his diagram on the web. Yeah. Boy, it's a good okay, thing you're all in front of that now, Marty. Take a look at that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other comments, questions? Well, I guess we ran the car. Oh, uh, Klaus, go ahead. Sorry, I just got on the other computer. Here. It's got the Nano uh, VNA. It's sixty-eight bucks. Uh, I guess that's the thing you guys are talking about. It's a ten kilohertz to fifteen hundred megahertz vector network analyzer kit. Yeah. MF, HF, VHF, UHF. Mm -hmm. So that basically takes the place of the Tenna Dipper and, and in its basic form. In the basic form, and plus it will do other things. Okay. Have you but, seen that? Hey. That's on Amazon, Amazon.ca. Just type in uh, nano VNA, it should come up. All right. Okay, any other any other comments, questions before we go? Well, hearing none, I guess uh, we've run the, uh, the the gamut tonight, 9.30. Well, that's good. Well, certainly a thoroughly enjoyable night. I thank everybody for uh, for joining us. I guess our next, uh, I don't have the dates in front of me, but I guess the next session will be the main club, uh, or not the main club, the main homebrew group uh, meeting on uh, the third Wednesday of the month. And then we'll have another one of these uh I think I started off calling these the quickie sessions, but they're coming in about as long, if not longer, than the regular one meeting, but that's okay, too. And I think Eric will be hosting that one, if I recall correctly. Oh, yeah, that's right, but uh, that is not until when? Uh, July the... No. Eh, well, it depends, actually, I guess, if we're going to be alternating. July 1st, because... The next one is a regular meeting, right? Third Wednesday. The next one will be the third Wednesday, and I'm not sure the exact date for the next uh, home, uh, the next uh, one of these ones. Yeah, it'd be July first, Canada Day, if we're still going to proceed with that. Uh, uh, everybody okay, okay with uh, carrying on this if it's on July first? Yeah, I'm okay with it. Don't see any heads going no. Not like uh, we, it's not like we can go anywhere, right? That's true. <laughs> Um, well, we can all go up to Doug Ford's cottage. Pardon? <laughs> I'll go to your garage and ransack it if you're not home. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, I notice also that I'm getting dire warnings from Jitsi when I fired up now about uh, insecure uh, meeting rooms. So uh, wonder if we should consider being proactive and start implementing a posted uh, password prior to the meetings uh, in the groups.io. Uh, I'm, I'm easy. It's what everybody wants. I know Dave would probably sleep better at night if we put a password on it. Or change the meeting ID. That's why, don't we, why don't we just put a password and keep the same password? Yeah, but you got to rotate the password. Why? You, you got to keep changing some something and instead of having a ID and a password, why don't you keep it simple and just change the uh, the meeting ID every two weeks or some every second meeting? We don't have to go security crazy here. Or don't do anything until somebody bombs us. <laughs> yeah. What's everybody think? Well, it seems okay. seems okay the way it is. Is everybody happy with the way? Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, I think uh, that uh, the way that it is is just fine, like you say, until, until we happen to have a problem. Um, confusing the issue by changing names and whatnot, uh, we're liable to... Uh, either lose some people because they can't remember where they were or not encourage any new people. We want to encourage as many new people as possible. So if we keep it simple until we have a, a, a problem, I would say that's, that's the status quo. I'm okay with that. If everybody else seems to do that, thumbs up. Yeah. I'm more sure. so like that than Dave. Klaus, go ahead. Uh, just a question from looking at all these kids that you guys built. Uh, somebody at Park has got an Altoid fetish, and I don't know who it is. <laughs> Actually, I think it was Frank because he made us all one year eat all the Altoids, the ca all the candies that came out of it. My brother-in-law in Florida is addicted to uh, Altoids, so I said to him one time, I said, you know what, save me some of those uh, tins that you have. Next time I went down to visit him, I, 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 he filled up my hand luggage. And I came back with him and said, here we go, Frank. We got Altoid tins coming out of the yin-yang. And, and Frank didn't want to use them because they had the raised letters on them. <laughs> I've got a box of uh, Altoid tins that, uh, without the raised uh, lettering on them. So if somebody's in need for an Altoid tin, I can provide it. Actually, speaking of the Altoids, Dan, um, when we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, using an 8307 for measuring RF power, one of the things the 8307 likes is, uh, is, is to be shielded. So in the uh, signal generator project uh, great upgrades, I've actually done that. I've put my circuit board in an Altoids tin, and that will be living in the case. So the Altoids tin becomes the uh, shield. So whoever wants to build one, see Frank. <laughs> okay. Well, if guess nothing else, then I guess uh, thanks again, everybody, uh, for for all your comments, questions, et cetera, and input. And I guess we'll see you on the third Wednesday. Good night, everyone, and uh, thank you, Peter, for hosting. Oh, no problem. Cheers. Right, thanks. Okay, good night. Thank you, Peter. A plethora of information for me tonight. Good. See everyone in a couple of weeks. Yeah. See y'all. Thanks, guys.